Solopack, the audio supplement to the study of current English. March 1989. News in brief. World News in Brief. December 7th. Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev announced that the Soviet Union would cut its armed forces unilaterally by 500,000 troops within the next two years. In his address to the United Nations General Assembly, Gorbachev also said that the Soviet Union would undertake to switch some industry from armaments to peaceful production. Gorbachev said that the Soviet cutback would include the withdrawal of 5,000 tanks as well as 50,000 troops from three East European countries, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Hungary. According to Soviet officials, the earthquake that struck Soviet Armenia killed tens of thousands of people and destroyed about half the buildings in the Republic's second and third largest cities. It is reported that the city of Leninakin, with a population of 290,000, and Kirovakin, where 170,000 people live, were hit hardest by the earthquake. The epicenter of the earthquake, which registered 6.9 on the Richter scale, was about 50 kilometers east of Leninakin. December 11th. The Soviet official news agency TASS reported that a Soviet military transport plane carrying soldiers to help victims of the Armenian earthquake crashed, killing 78 people aboard. TASS said the plane, an Ilyushin 76, crashed as it approached the airport in Leninakin, a northern Armenian city near the earthquake's epicenter. Airport authorities said the plane had gone down after hitting a helicopter near the airport, where scores of aircraft were bringing in relief equipment. December 12th. At least 42 people were killed and about 200 injured in a train collision on the outskirts of London. The crash occurred shortly after 8 a.m. on one of the busiest stretches of track leading into London. Police and British rail officials said that an oncoming commuter train from Poole in Dorset, traveling at about 65 kilometers per hour, slammed to the rear of a stationary commuter train, and a third train plowed into the wreckage. The two commuter trains were carrying an estimated 1,400 passengers. December 13th. Yasser Arafat, the chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization, made a dramatic appeal for peace negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis. Arafat, addressing the United Nations General Assembly, which was convened in Geneva, said the PLO will seek a comprehensive settlement among the parties concerned in the Arab-Israeli conflict, including the state of Palestine, Israel, and other neighbors. December 15th. The United States made its first official contact with the Palestine Liberation Organization following U.S. President Ronald Reagan's decision to reverse a long-standing policy and open a dialogue with the group. At a news conference the day before, U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz said the PLO had issued a statement in which it accepted United Nations Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, recognized Israel, and renounced terrorism. Schultz said the United States is prepared for a substantive dialogue with PLO representatives. December 19th. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi of India, starting a five-day visit to China, called for a renewal of friendship and a solution to the Himalayan border dispute. Gandhi, the first Indian leader to visit China since his grandfather, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, 34 years ago, said that the border was a major problem, but that it was now time to look to the future. December 21st, a Pan American World Airways jumbo jet bound for New York with 258 people on board crashed in the small Scottish village of Lockerbie. Officials said there was no hope of survivors. The plane, Flight 103, filled with holiday travelers, crashed about an hour after leaving London's Heathrow Airport. Eyewitnesses said they saw a huge explosion and a 100 meter fireball near a gasoline station in Lockerbie. December 30th, the Yugoslav government resigned in reaction to mounting criticism of its handling of the country's economic crisis, becoming the first government to step down since the communists took power after World War II. Prime Minister Branko Mikulic, a 60-year-old economist and ally of Tito, who took office in May 1986, was seen as a hardliner in the party. His resignation indicated that reform-oriented forces were gaining the upper hand. 
January 4th, two U.S. F-14 fighter planes shot down two Libyan MiG-23 jet fighters in a dogfight over the Mediterranean off the coast of Libya. Pentagon officials called it an act of self-defense. U.S. Defense Secretary Frank Carlucci said that the F-14 Tomcats fired four air-to-air missiles at the Libyan jets after the Libyan aircraft threateningly chased the Americans across the skies about 65 kilometers off the Libyan coast. The dogfight came amid increasing controversy over the Reagan administration allegations that Libya is building a huge chemical weapons plant, a charge the Libyan government has denied. January 8th, Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze said that the Soviet Union would begin unilaterally destroying its stockpile of chemical weapons this year without waiting for a treaty eliminating such arms. U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz pointed out that the United States already was proceeding with a program of destroying its older chemical arms. Both men spoke in Paris during an international conference on banning chemical arms. A British Midland Airways Boeing 737 carrying 126 people crashed along a highway as it attempted an emergency landing. The Belfast-bound airliner broke into three pieces after it slammed into the edge of Britain's main north-south highway, the M1. The crash occurred near East Midlands Airport, which is in central England, about 160 kilometers north of London. Officials said there were 44 confirmed deaths. January 9th, Buckingham Palace and the UK government said that Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and Sir Geoffrey Howe, the Foreign Secretary, would represent Britain at the late Japanese Emperor Hirohito's funeral February 24th. Palace sources said that Queen Elizabeth acted on the advice of her ministers in deciding who should represent the royal family at the funeral. Some World War II veterans and politicians who regard Hirohito as a war criminal had urged the government and the royal family to boycott the funeral. Home news in brief. December 24th. Mount Tokachi, located in central Hokkaido, erupted several times, forcing some 1,000 local residents and tourists to evacuate from the area. Red-hot magma and heated cinders belched out of a crater of the 2,077-meter-high volcano, and a column of gray smoke rose some 300 meters high. As a mudslide flowed down toward B.A. Town, the town authorities ordered some 160 tourists enjoying Christmas Eve at Shirogane Hot Spring Resort to move away for safety reasons. Six tax reform bills passed through the House of Councilors at the end of a marathon plenary session that dragged out for 26 hours. The passage of the bills came 159 days after the extraordinary session was convened on July 19, 1988. The tax bills, which impose a 3% consumption tax on goods and services, go into effect on April 1, 1989. December 27, following the enactment of six tax reform bills, Prime Minister Noboru Takeshita reshuffled his 20-member cabinet. He named 15 new ministers, but retained five others, including Foreign Minister Sosuke Uno. Takeshita nominated Takashi Hasegawa, 76, as Justice Minister. Hasegawa will be in charge of public prosecutors probing the recruit scandal. December 28th, the National Police Agency has announced that 17,695 people were arrested for violating laws to control stimulants during the first 10 months of 1988. The number was almost the same as the previous year. The total amount of heroin confiscated during the same period reached a record high of 17.2 kilograms, while that of stimulants seized radically decreased to 181.1 kilograms from 620.5 kilograms for the same period the previous year. December 30th, a man drove away with a cash delivery van containing 322.5 million yen in cash in Kobe. The police reported that the robbery took place in front of the Suma branch of Taiyo Kobe Bank before 10 a.m., The van, owned by Nippon Express, also carried 178 million yen in checks and bills. Takashi Hasegawa resigned as Justice Minister after it was revealed that he had received political donations from the scandal-ridden recruit company. It was only three days after he was appointed to the post. Following the resignation of Hasegawa, Prime Minister Noboru Takeshita appointed former Supreme Court Judge Masami Takatsuji to the post. December 31st, 
Kyoko Imakiire, 23, became the first woman to complete a solo Trans-Pacific round-trip voyage when she returned to her home port in Kagoshima aboard her yacht, the Kaiden Tarachine. Imakiire, a former Kagoshima Municipal Government employee, left Kagoshima on June 11th and arrived in San Francisco on August 20th. The 22,000-kilometer round trip took her more than six months, including a two-month stay in San Francisco. January 7th, the emperor died of cancer of the duodenum at 6.33 a.m. at the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. He was 87. Crown Prince Akihito, 55, immediately succeeded to the imperial throne to become the 125th emperor of Japan. The demise of Emperor Hirohito brings the Showa era to an end. Following Emperor Showa's death, the government in the afternoon chose Heisei as the name of the new era. January 9th. The Nikkei stock average recorded an all-time high of 30,678.39 yen in the Tokyo Stock Exchange's first session since the emperor's death. It was 468.85 yen higher than the closing level recorded on the previous business day. The increase in the Nikkei stock index was the largest since January 6, 1988, when the index soared 1,215.22 yen. Your newscasters this month have been Frank Rogers and Dan Coughlin. Voices in the Headlines. News highlights in sound. Compiled with the cooperation of ABC News. This is Mal Adams with Voices in the Headlines. The terror was sudden and horrible. Pan American World Airways Flight 103, a jumbo 747, loaded with American servicemen, American college students, and Americans who work abroad, coming home for the Christmas holidays. Six miles over the peaceful Scottish village of Lockerbie. The whole thing exploded in a ball of flames. Well, the whole Flight 103 broke up, some say exploded, and plummeted from the sky so fast it simply vanished from controller's radar screens. A huge fireball lit the evening sky over Lockerbie, turning night into day. Some say a gasoline station was hit by a piece of wreckage and exploded. Large pieces of the aircraft plowed into two rows of houses in the village, killing many inhabitants as they sat down for dinner. All too soon, the dreaded news came from the Royal Air Force, which was coordinating the rescue efforts. We do know that uh, there are no survivors um, from the crash. The sun rose over Lockerbie, and British leaders joined the villagers to offer what help and consolation they could. Prince Andrew, who had served in the Falkland Islands War, was stunned. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher seemed at a loss for words. The damage to this, this town is, is worse in daylight than we could possibly have seen at night. Uh, the destruction of the houses, uh, uh, that place near the whole houses near the road, and the crater, and the amount of the metal. 258 people died in the plane, and in Lockerbie, where at least 15 were killed, one resident said, Well, it ain't going to be Christmas anymore. It's just going to be a time of sadness. What made Flight 103 plunge to Earth? A Pan-American spokesman comments in New York. There was no prior indication that there were any problems with the aircraft. There was no contact uh, prior, any Mayday signals. Uh, the aircraft had made normal con contact with uh, the control center. And so the thinking turned toward sabotage. The possibility of sabotage has not been ruled out. The State Department's Phyllis Oakley confirmed that someone had called a U.S. Embassy threatening a pre-Christmas explosion aboard a Pan Am flight. Oakley said the threat was taken seriously enough to pass it on to the FAA and to other embassies. Our focus is on alerting those people with the responsibility and the possibility of doing something about security. And this is what we do when we go to the FAA and to the carriers. They are the people that have to physically handle the security from threats. And a Pan Am spokeswoman confirmed that the airline stepped up its security. We were notified earlier in the month regarding the possibility of threats against Pan American World Airways flight. Um, as is our normal procedure, uh, when we receive this kind of information, uh, we immediately...
immediately put into place uh, a supplemental security uh, procedure uh, around the world. Two Middle Eastern groups called to take responsibility for the bombing, although neither claim could be verified. Not that all sides weren't trying to find out what happened. FBI Director William Sessions said his agency is joining the investigation. The FBI's involvement comes with the agreement of New Scotland Yard authorities in England. Uh, further, FBI personnel uh, will be at the crash site to observe and provide technical advice to the Scottish authorities. Could a bomb have been placed aboard Flight 103 despite the heavy security? A security expert at London's Heathrow Airport says yes. It's still possible for a bomb to get through and get onto the aircraft and for the passenger, if he leaves at a transit stop, to be missed. That's still possible. Also, it's possible for a bomb to be placed in the cargo uh, of the aircraft that's being carried on the aircraft. As investigators listened to the flight recorder that was recovered from the wreckage, they heard no indications of trouble in the voices of the flight crew. But there is a faint noise just before the recording stops. President Reagan tried to offer words of consolation to the bereaved. I want to express our sorrow and our concern for the families and friends of those who died in the crash of the Pan American Flight 103. There are many difficult aspects to this tragedy, but none so compelling as the anguish of those families who will not have their loved ones with them this Christmas season. So went the word this month, and voices in the headlines. Correspondence Corner. This month, John Woodruff of the Baltimore Sun talks about the recruit scandal. The interviewer is Susan Chira of the New York Times. Today we're talking with John Woodruff, who's the correspondent for the Baltimore Sun newspaper. John came to Tokyo from Beijing, where he's completed a five-year tour and has written a book about his experiences in Beijing, which will be out uh, as you read this magazine. And please remind me of the title, John. The title is China in Search of Its Future. So, but this time we're going to talk about Japan and not China. And I'd like to start off by asking John uh, his impressions of what's come to be an obsessive news story for most Japanese, perhaps less so for most Americans, the, the recruit affair. Um, first, I'd like to ask John how he thinks Americans have seen this scandal and what lessons they're drawing from it about Japan. Uh, it's still seen, I think, at least in, uh, among readers of the Baltimore Sun and among editors of the Baltimore Sun, uh, basically as a stock market scandal with political ramifications. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Japanese put the emphasis in exactly the opposite uh, direction. They, they see this as a political scandal since politics involves money, naturally spilled over into the business community. I think that, that John is touching on an important point, which has been that for me, as an American, one of the interesting things about the Japanese reaction is just how little true outrage in some ways there has been, which is, as John was saying, I think stemming from the fact that most Japanese consider that politics and money are so deeply intertwined that this has not surprised them, even though it may make them angry and disgusted. What do you think about that? Disgusted is the word that I would use. Uh, a lot of Japanese are disgusted, but the people that I talk to seem to be disgusted in the sense that they're disgusted that things are just the way they thought they were, or that things are just as bad as they thought they were. Uh, or maybe they're a little worse than they thought they were, but still in the same direction. There's no sense that this is something worse than we expected. On the other hand, it's laying out in more detail, and I think probably the longer-term effect on public opinion will be rather different, I think, because it, uh, it gives people a clearer picture of the actual mechanics. 
It gives uh, people a, a clear picture of what it is that you're looking for and how influence doesn't necessarily mean that you get a specific thing from the government. Sometimes it just means that you get put on a committee or you get talking rights to talk about something. And that seems to me to be a very good, it's almost like a big civics lesson for the Japanese public. And, and that, I think, will have a longer-term effect that, uh, that will probably go much deeper than, than the effect we're seeing right now. Yeah. It seems to me you can draw up a wonderful, elaborate sort of flow chart right. with where the money comes from, where it goes, who you need to influence in order to make your way into which circle. And, and, and that has been really fascinating because these are the kinds of transactions that obviously have gone on a great deal, but have been kept pretty shrouded in secrecy. I think we also have to watch out, though, in this respect. I think Recruit, while it's ins very instructional and educational, is, in a sense, something new and different. And it's uh, probably untypical of the really big operations in Japanese money mm -hmm. politics. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, it gives us instruction of how an outsider tries to work his way in. It does not give us any instruction in how Mitsubishi or Sumitomo exercises political influence. That's going to be a whole different story, and we don't have any clear evidence of how that works yes. at this time. It's interesting for people who complain about the closed nature of the Japanese system. One of the interesting lessons about Recruit is it can be just as closed against a Japanese outsider as it can against outsiders of other nationalities, and it's very difficult to penetrate that system. Uh, many people I've talked to have also made the point that you had here a non-traditional industry, a man of an immense and overweening ambition who wanted to move fast instead of building slowly, as other outsiders have done successfully. Yeah, I think, well, the, the man has not shown himself to be your classic insider, whether you think in European or American terms or in, in Asian terms. It, he, he has not functioned as your classic insider. I think that's why this particular operation became vulnerable and got caught up and, and exposed. It was, uh, it was vulnerable precisely because the man was coming from the outside. My editors ask, well, is this the way all business is done in Japan, or is this what an American company has to do to make it in Japan? And I have felt and said that I don't think that would be the correct implication to draw from recruit. How do you view this? Well, I think that's a really very, very difficult question. Uh, I don't think you could expect a foreign operator to come in to Japan and succeed even to the extent that Mr. Aizoi has uh, using those methods. On the other hand, I do think it's been demonstrated over and over again uh, that money is the lubricant of everything here, uh, of politics, but not only politics, also of business transactions. I don't mean to suggest that money is unimportant in, in business anywhere. It's, it, money is what business is about in the final analysis, but how it's carried back and forth and how, how the transactions work uh, is very different here from what it is in other places. Mm -hmm. Although I think we should stress that the amount of money involved for each individual was relatively small. If we look at the case of Mr. Shinto, I mean this $80,000 is nothing to a man of his position. So I, I think the other difference about Japan is that I would perhaps put a slightly different emphasis it's not that money greases everything, it's that relationships grease everything, which can be aided by discrete gifts, but gifts that are not on the scale of the corruption we see in mm -hmm. Wall Street scandals in New York. And the element of personal greed is also different, I feel. That is, people tend to be taking money for the company or for the advancement of a particular agenda rather than taking it and spending it for their personal use. Absolutely, particularly in, in Shinto's case. So the, the first question you had to ask was, what did $80,000 mean to him? Uh, and the answer, of course, is, is uh, not uh, to think in terms of, of what he was getting from it. What that money was that, that went into his account appears to have been money that he could then use to improve NTT's relationships with people with whom it might not have had as easy relationships otherwise. I think the final question we might want to look at is whether this will force any changes in the system as it works, 
and whether the damage to Japan's international reputation is such that changes have to be made. What do you think about that argument? You can't destroy the international credibility of the people who have all the money in the world. That's not going to happen. What is likely to happen, I think, is that at a time when Japan is attempting to build its financial position into a major position in world financial markets, uh, and in fact when the strength of the yen requires that Japan do that, right at that moment the, the world is getting a look at how stock and financial relationships work in Japan and will raise serious questions and will increase the pressure for a revision in traditional ways of doing certain kinds of business here. Thank you very much for your interesting comments. Telephone conversation. Preparing to leave. Model dialogue. Yes, may I help you? I need to talk to someone about canceling our newspaper delivery. I see. Will this be a temporary stop? Would you like to resume delivery at a later date? No, we're leaving the area. We just want to cancel it altogether. I see. We'll stop delivery at the beginning of next week. Dialogue one. Is this the billing office? Yes, that's right. How may I help you? We want to settle up on our account. We're leaving the area soon. I see. May I have your name, please? Yes, it's Kanazawa. The address is 1015 Maywood Lane. Right. I have the account right here, Mrs. Kanazawa. We'll close it out for you and send you the final bill. You should have it by the end of the week. Thanks for your quick help. Dialogue 2. I'm calling about our telephone. Is there a problem with the service, sir? No, it's not that at all. I want to arrange to have it disconnected. We're moving from the area. Oh, I see. When would you like the service terminated? We'll be in the house until next Wednesday. Can you take care of it sometime after that? No problem. We'll disconnect the line Thursday morning. Dialogue 3. Is this the Acme Real Estate Agency? Yes, this is Miss Green speaking. Can I do something for you? This is Hiromichi Kawada calling. We rent the house on Maple Street from you. Yes, Mr. Kawada. I just want to tell you that we're not going to renew our lease on the house when it comes due next month. We'll be moving back to Osaka. Would you please come into the office with your lease contract so we'll get it all wrapped up? Dialogue 4. Are you canceling your housing contract because there's something wrong with the house? No, that isn't it at all. We do have other houses in the area. We can find one that you'll like better. No, that's not it. I'm being transferred back to Tokyo. We'll be leaving at the end of next month. In that case, let me wish you the best of luck. This has been Paul Gilbert and Linda Gilbert. Thank you very much for practicing these dialogues. You've been listening to Side A of Sonopac. Please stay with us for Side B, 